Hey, good evening. Oh my gosh, that was terrible. Good evening. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Um, I, I know that I sound like a broken record, but I do ask everybody to silence their cell phones now before we get the program started. Uh, next, next week we'll be back to Thursday nights. So that's uh, Thursday, December 7th at 7 p.m. We'll have class five. Dr. Gary, Gary Kaplan will be back with us. Uh, his lecture is called More Bombs, Bigger Bombs, Better Bombs, and I'll let you figure out what that's going to be about. But we will cover a lot of fun stuff in that, like the Manhattan Project, H bombs, massive retaliation, mutual assured destructions, lots of happy things to get us into the New Year spirit. Um, but yeah, it will be a good talk, so please come. That's Thursday, December 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, the next week at Lunch and Books, Tuesday, December 28th at noon. We're going to be talking about some lesser known West Virginia anthems, everything from 19th century marches to a brand new song that Eli Lamy, who will be our presenter, will, uh, will play for us. He's written it himself, and these are uh, lesser known West Virginia anthems. That's to get us ready for our first Lunch with Books of 2022, in which we'll be talking about uh, Country Roads, John Denver's iconic song, one of four official West Virginia state songs. Turns 50 years old this year, and Dr. Sarah Morris at WVU has been writing a book about it. Bob Gaudio will also be with us um, to sing the song for us. So that's next week, December 28th at noon with Eli Lamby, and then Tuesday, January 4th at noon with Dr. Morris and Bob Gaudio. And just a reminder, the library will be closed this, this Friday and Saturday, and then the following week, Friday and Saturday as well, for Christmas and New Year's. All right, tonight's instructor is Dr. William Hal Gorby. He's a teaching assistant professor of history and the director of undergraduate advising at West Virginia University. He teaches courses on West Virginian, Appalachian, and American immigration history. He consulted on the research and script editing for the Emmy-nominated PBS American Experience documentary, The Mine Wars, and hosted a research podcast. And you have, if you haven't listened to this, you can look it up online and listen to this. It's, it's excellent. It's called Henry, the Life and Times of Wheeling's Most Notorious Brewer, produced by Wheeling Heritage Media. Hal's book, Wheeling's Polonia, Reconstructing Polish Community in, a, in the West Virginia Steel Town, was published by WB Press in 2020. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Hal Gorby. All right. We're live in person and online. Told I need to stand right here so everybody <laughs> remotely can see me, especially my mother. My mom can chime in and tell me whether she can see me. I forgot to pull your PowerPoint back oh, up. Oh, that's okay. there you go. Thanks everybody for coming out. I know uh, you've been doing these classes on Thursdays. Uh, and with the way things are going in the professional sports world, I was worried the Steelers would end up having a game scheduled today and <laughs> the crowd would be a lot. Appreciate it. Um, you've mainly been looking in the, the class up to this point on sort of the foreign policy and the military ramifications of what happened during the Cold War. Uh, and today is the fun part for me to kind of take us back to the home front, and see what kind of reaction was this causing uh, here in America. Um, and on the slide, opening slide here, you have several different images. Uh, you have, of course, Joe McCarthy. I don't know what it is, but I feel like I'm always involved in some way with Joe McCarthy. Two years ago, I actually played Joe McCarthy at the, this event at the Florida Hotel. Uh, but you all have that sort of slot image of the Red Men's and then the sort of suburban family uh, in the suburbs. Uh, I think it's a very good juxtaposition for this time period. Uh, it's often referred to as the age of anxiety. It is a period of great concern about communism, the foreign subversion at home, but it's also the height of American prosperity after World War II. So, this is a sort of very strong economic time in the country, but a time when many Americans are afraid of what's, uh, what's happening. Um, and as you, and I've been watching the classes online as, as you've had the first few of them, and you've talked about the various sort of, you know, things that are happening in Eastern Europe, that are happening in Asia and elsewhere, and Americans at home are reacting to these in a variety of ways. So, uh, what I want to look at for tonight is to look at the effects, the second Red Scare, one way of referring to it, most people refer to it as McCarthyism, refer to it just as a central figure. Uh, I want to look at sort of the effects this had on sort of politics 
on uh, the labor movement and on elements of our culture, particularly education and uh, television and film. Uh, but of course, the reaction to the Cold War on the home front uh, impacts dramatically American politics as much as it affected our foreign policy and our military. After World War II, this is still the height of what we would call sort of the New Deal period under uh, you know, President Roosevelt and then President Truman. Um, and the Democratic Party has a variety of hopes after the war that they are going to push through a bunch of extensions to what the New Deal of the 1930s had done. Truman lays out a, a variety of proposals to provide for housing, education funding, universal health care, sort of the main issue of what he's calling his fair deal, uh, full employment legislation, among many, many, many other, other types of uh, things. Uh, but with the context of the Cold War that's starting to escalate in 1945, 1946, uh, and along with the rising strike wave that uh, hits the country very hard in 19, early 1946 and throughout the entire year, particularly even in place of the wheel year, uh, this feeds into the 1946 election cycle when uh, Republicans uh, run across the country uh, calling the Democrats and Truman's administration soft on communism and also criticizing inflation, uh, concerns about large labor strikes as well. Uh, the Republican slogan that year was had enough, enough of economic concerns and foreign policy concerns, and Republicans took back control of Congress in 1946. Uh, and this idea of being soft on communism would be sort of a, a, sort of a useful sort of political attack for the next several decades or so. Uh, and relatively quickly, uh, this sort of anti-communism within post-war politics emerges uh, in both parties. And particularly for uh, President Truman, he responds uh, on both the foreign policy level with the Truman Doctrine in response to the crisis in Greece and Turkey. And a few days after announcing that Truman Doctrine requesting funding for uh, aid to Greece and Turkey, uh, Truman, through executive order, institutes a federal employee loyalty program. And this was in response to concerns that there were communists in the federal government. Historians debated this throughout the Cold War, whether this was overblown or true. We now know, starting in the 90s, there were a number of communists in the government. How many? Dozens? Less than 100? Some people would say, that's not that many. Some people would say, that's too many. One communist in government could be too many. Uh, and the goal of this loyalty program was to sort of force all federal agencies to check their employees. They worked with the FBI and asked if there were any uh, sort of dossiers or information they had, uh, credible intelligence on anyone. Um, there are loose estimates on how many people left government at this time, either because of their prior associations or because of just fear at the time. Uh, but if you were a candidate for a federal job, you had to take this and sign this loyalty to be able to be employed in the federal government. Uh, and you could be immediately uh, terminated if you were seen to be disloyal. Uh, and that was defined relatively broadly. One of the key elements of this was creating what was known as the Attorney General's List that began uh, keeping track of a list of organizations uh, that were listed as subversive. These were communists. These were perceived as communist front organizations supporting the efforts that communists uh, internationally were supporting. It eventually became a list that included a lot of organizations that we would say are just advocating for change in a variety of different ways. civil rights groups, labor, labor groups. Now, the apparatuses of the second Red Scare had already been in existence for some time since the first Red Scare after World War I and in the early 1920s. Uh, and even during the New Deal, there was a concern about the role of communists in the various New Deal programs. In particular, in 1938, the House of Representatives created the House on Un-American Activities Committee. This was at a time in the 1930s when the Communist Party in the United States claimed to have about 80,000 members. A huge number, but a significant number. Uh, and those numbers were on the decline, actually, by the post-World War II period. But beginning in the late 30s and throughout World War II, the HUAC committees, as it was known, began looking for the role of communists, particularly in the CIO, Congress of Industrial Organization and Labor Unions. They investigated the role of communists within the Federal Theater Project, which they uh, got closed down in 1939. 
And they uh, it looked at a variety of instances where there may have been communist influence within other federal programs and agencies as well. And once the war is over, what really ratchets up this sort of concern of communists and government again is a number of key cases involving espionage and spies. There were a lot of concerns and stories about this in the late 40s. Um, and in 1945, 1946, there were a number of sort of these uh, cases that started popping up. One of the earliest was a raid that happened on a journal called Amerasia. Amerasia. Uh, it was a pro-Chinese communist journal and it uncovered a series of classified documents which had been gotten through unconventional means, you could say and showed evidence of an atomic spy ring operating out of Canada. As time went on, HUAC began to investigate a variety of other individuals. And one of the key members of HUAC is this gentleman that you see here, who was elected to Congress in 1946, Richard M. Nixon of California, later president. Nixon, as one of the key sort of young uh, guns, so to speak, on the HUAC committee, really made a name for himself involving one of the early cases brought against a State Department official named Alger Hiss. Uh, it is fair to say that Hiss was engaging in espionage and other activities. Um, the investigation was largely brought to the forefront when a former communist named Whitaker Chambers brought charges that Hiss had been involved in a number of organizations throughout the 30s and had moved up through various elements of the federal government. He was in the State Department in the late 30s throughout the 40s. And Chambers argued he had incriminating evidence on his. Um, this evidence was later discovered. It was microfilm that was discovered in a hollowed out pumpkin in a field. Which seems a little sketchy. Um, uh, Nixon, in his questioning of his before the committee, brought a lot of national attention to himself. This is really his claim to claim to notoriety early in his career, uh, even though some people questioned Nixon's tactics on the committee. Uh, his, because the incidents that were in question had passed the statute of limitations, it was too difficult to prove espionage, but it was proven that he had lied before the committee, and he was uh, sentenced uh, for committing perjury. Chambers also had kind of committed perjury as well, so it raised a lot of doubts for a number of years about who was really telling the truth. We now know his was directly involved in the the more notable case came against Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Uh, Julius Rosenberg was involved in atomic energy research, um, atomic bombs. Uh, and we now know, thanks to releases in the 1990s, most notably through what was known as the Venona Intercepts, that listed 349 individuals who were involved in one way or another in uh, either efforts to steal classified information or give classified information to the Soviets. And Julius Rosenberg is often listed in a lot of these documents. Uh, the Rosenbergs are charged. Uh, their prosecution is led by a young federal prosecutor named Roy Cohn. Uh, he will come back. Uh, becomes his claim to fame before he's involved in the next decade. Uh, and they are eventually executed. Now, with those cases, and this is often a misconception in the way people remember this period, because you think of it as the age of McCarthy. And people think, well, McCarthy's the one in charge, the guy after his. Well, actually, that wasn't McCarthy. McCarthy's going to build off of these earlier efforts that actually, to be fair, found actual communists who were doing things that uh, were very questionable and treasonous. It's what makes this period so interesting is what happens after these initial few cases. The federal loyalty program was very successful in rooting out communists in the government. It was very successful, but it was taking time. So what becomes interesting is the way the HUAC and then later the Senate committee led by Joseph McCarthy began to expand the scope of looking for communists in American society in areas that now we look back on and we raise some eyebrows. One of the earliest involved Hollywood. HUAC benefited from the fact that they got a lot of undercover uh, reports from people within various elements of American society education, religious, even within the entertainment industry itself. Uh, for example, Metro Goldwyn Mayer at the time was a very conservative uh, film, in, uh, film industry giant. Uh, Louis Mayer himself, a very prominent conservative donor. Uh, another key person they had was J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, and the various uh, card system files that the FBI had been keeping. 
But there was a lot of concerns about Hollywood. In 1947, HUAC begins an in-depth investigation of a variety of aspects of society, but the one that gets the most attention is Hollywood, because it's Hollywood, of course. They investigate movie actors and actresses. They investigate uh, screen actors, um, the Screen Actors Guild. They investigate uh, writers and others within the industry. Um, and here you begin to see the common practice that we'll see carried out over the next 10 years of asking individuals that they're giving, they're giving information about from the FBI or from informants. They uh, testify before the committee and they ask these individuals about your previous associations back to the 20s and 30s and 40s. For, in Hollywood itself and in that area, there was a strike in the early 40s uh, among Disney workers. And there was a lot of you know, people asking about where were the communists involved back during that strike and some of these earlier incidents. And if you were brought before HUAC, you were expected to give names of individuals of the organizations you were involved with. It, 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 there were people who admitted, it. I'm a communist. I'm not going to give you names. I don't have to do that. I will talk about myself. Others will plead the fifth, inserting their Fifth Amendment privilege to not incriminate themselves or others. Others will be largely sort of suggested throughout the testimony of HUAC to be guilty because of their associations with certain groups and because they were friends with certain other people who had been named previously by the committee. Uh, this gets to be a very sort of tenuous strain the further out uh, it gets. The highlight of the investigation involved a group of 10 Hollywood screenwriters known as the Hollywood 10, uh, led by Adult Trumbo and many others, uh, who were refused to uh, follow the committee's protocol and were blacklisted by Hollywood. Many of them famously uh, wrote scripts under pseudonyms throughout the 50s and 60s. And there were a number of other actors in Hollywood who were effectively blacklisted. The most prominent would have been Eugene Robinson. You remember the gangster Eugene Robinson. He had this period in his career where he wasn't really in film, and he, he gets to come back. I believe his first film, he comes back as the Ten Commandments, where he plays this sort of villainous sort of character. That was the kind of characters he had to play because he had been effectively blacklisted. Lee J. Cobb is another sort of individual who's kind of effectively blacklisted. Here you can see a group of act Hollywood actors sort of going to the hearings to support. Uh, they were led by Humphrey Bogart, the top actor of the time. And Bogart was very vocal initially, but then had to back off when people started questioning some of the film roles he had been in and some of the scripts. There was a lot of questioning of various films at the time. One film that got loosely criticized at the time, which is appropriate for this week, was a film starring Jimmy Stewart. It came out in 1946. Where Jimmy Stewart, you know, uh, you know, help runs a building and loan organization and helps his neighbors out. And then if you know the end of the film, everybody gives him money and it's kind of critical of the local banker. At the time, Huack actually was concerned that the film was one of the most anti-capitalist films ever. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, of course, which is now a holiday classic. Uh, Screen Actors Guild President Ronald Reagan at the time actually was very defensive of HUAC's broad investigation. And I don't want to read what he said in one of his testimonies. He said, quote, we already know who the communists are. They tell us. I do not believe the communists have ever at any time been able to use the motion picture screen as a sounding board for their philosophy or ideology. Uh, and he raised sort of questions about, you know, just because they're communists necessarily, you know, we, we need to be careful that this is a society where people can join organizations, but we're free to you know, criticize those organizations, make sure that uh, the people don't have a very problem. Uh, but early in his career, you know, he, he was actually very concerned about uh, how, how deep this was going. You have the Hollywood 10 here at the bottom, Reagan testifying. A, very, a number of actors gave very dramatic testimonies. Gary Cooper was repeatedly asked about films he had been in. Uh, and he admitted he didn't think that any of them had a communist level of influence. Uh, Robert Taylor was more critical and at one point said he thinks all of them should be sent back to Russia where they belong. And a lot of support. Uh, and Bogart actually in March of 48 actually had to give a public apology and sort of an answer that he was not himself a communist. Uh, because he had been so vocal in his 
defense of the Hollywood Ten, among others. Now, again, to take a step back, what we're seeing by 1948 is a broader anti-communist network that is developed. Again, the whole point here is to then set up the fact that if we focus on one individual in particular, but we really should see the broad scopes of this. Of course, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, play a sort of major role uh, throughout this period, probably the most important in terms of carrying over some of the practices we saw after the first Red Scare. The role of loyalty screenings and loyalty oaths become a common practice throughout public and private employment in America at this time. And chambers of commerce, the Catholic Church in particular, labor unions become very active in trying to support anti-communist efforts and initiatives. And in the late 40s and 50s, this is when you see this resurgence of patriotism, uh, public civic parades to talk about how great uh, the American uh, system of government is. Uh, probably the best manifestation of this is the Freedom Train, uh, which went around the country carrying historic documents. It actually stopped here in Wheeling in 1948, down by uh, where Heritage Port is today. Uh, it had the sort of top, sort of most popular documents, not, and none of which really raised any of the like critical things in American history, like slavery, you know, anything about like, the role of labor, and, you know, the working class. Uh, there was very little about African American history involved, so it was this sort of very, very hyper patriotic sort of display. And local city governments passed anti-radical ordinances preventing uh, people from being on the Communist Party to have jobs in local Well, of course, I know you're all wondering, but where does Joe McCarthy come into play? Well, he's coming into play off of all of this. I mean, we haven't mentioned him up to this point. Ah, there he is. This is from the Wheeling uh, newspaper uh, after McCarthy's visit, uh, his famous or infamous visit, depending on how you want to categorize it. Um, McCarthy had really not been part of this anti-communist network prior to early 1950. He had not been involved in this in any way. And he gains attention, as you all know, thanks to a famous speech that he gives on Thursday, February the 9th, 1950, here in downtown Wheeling at the McClure Hotel. Uh, he was invited uh, by the High County Republican Women's Committee. Um, and this was part of the Lincoln Day dinners that were being held across the country. And this is I'm a deep Wheeling historian. I love everything about Wheeling, but let's be honest. We did not get the top big wigs in the Republican Party nationally to come to Wheeling for this event. We got Joe McCarthy. Just, just given the context. Now, in hindsight, it will seem like he's a much bigger figure after the fact. McCarthy was kind of a little known figure uh, in 1950. Uh, he had actually gotten elected in 1946 in an amazing campaign where he beat out uh, Senator LaFollette uh, in Wisconsin, which was a big feat because the LaFollette family was a dominant political family in the early 1900s. In his first few years, he had made a name for himself as being referred to as the Pepsi-Cola kid because he had been the chief supporter of the Pepsi-Cola and soft drink companies who wanted to get rid of wartime rationing on sugar. Um, and it was looking like he was not going to get reelected in 1952. And talking to some friends, in January of 1950, they urged him to get on this communist and government issue and to say, you know, yeah, the Truman administration is looking for communists and government, but are they doing it? Context is important for what you've been learning up to this point. What has happened? Well, China's fallen to the communists. The Soviets have tested an atomic bomb. How has this happened? There must still be communists and government. Within a few months, we're going to go into the war in Korea. So when McCarthy comes to Wheeling on February the 9th, as you know, gives a dramatic speech that actually the local press kind of says it was kind of a quaint speech, you know, at the time they were like, it was nice, the local radio covered it. And of course, the, the thing that got the headlines, of course, was the dramatic part of the speech, uh, which I will quote here. I will not read it dramatically, which I did when I was in uh, McCarthy's key uh, charge was, quote, the State Department is infested with communists. I have here in my hand a list of 205 names that were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping policy in the State Department. 
he had no list. He just waved a piece of his speech. He just waved a piece of it. The AP, who had a reporter at the event, picked up the story and it gained wider attention. When asked after it being at the McCourt, he never again mentioned the 205 number. Uh, when later asked, it was 81. He was giving a series of speeches in Salt Lake City, in Reno, Nevada. The number kept changing when he was asked. It goes from 81, and it goes to 57, it goes back to 81, it never goes back to 205. Three weeks later, he comes up with this list of 57, and it was revealed that all the people that were in this list of 57 had already been purged under the federal loyalty program. But then he, he, he basically stuck to it. This led to an, a Senate investigation led by Maryland Senator Millard Titus. They called hearings. This was a subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee. And this, this hearing was to try to denounce McCarthy's charges, but it had the inverse effect of actually ratcheting up the public attention to what he was saying. Public opinion polls at the time showed that Americans were becoming convinced by what McCarthy was saying in the context of what had happened over the last years. And to kind of save himself, so to speak, McCarthy alleges in these hearings that the top Russian spy in the State Department's Far Eastern Division is a professor named Owen Lattimore. Lat McCarthy used very colorful rhetoric, rhetoric, but produced no substantial evidence to support his allegations. Lattimore is brought in front of the committee. He has asked a lot of grueling questions, and he's later forced to step down. Not because they proved that he was a spy, but just because of these associations that were made. The Tidings Committee report bashed McCarthy. It called his charges, quote, fraud and a hoax, and said that the result of McCarthy's actions was to, quote, this is important, confuse and divide the American people to a degree far beyond the hopes of the communists themselves, end quote. But it didn't have an effect. Tidings himself is up for re-election in 1950, and McCarthy campaigns actively against him, and he's defeated in that election. McCarthy becomes a sort of prominent speaker for candidates running for office in 1950 and 1952. And this is around the time in March of 1950 when the term McCarthyism first appears, thanks to the famous uh, Washington Post cartoonist Herb Block. And it's, ever, it's been used ever since as a synonym for use of demagoguery, baseless political attacks and defamation and mudslinging. McCarthy attacked very many people throughout the government and was a national celebrity. And it's, it's important to, this is why the heirs referred to as McCarthy. For about four years, he is the lead sort of political darling uh, in the press and in the national news. He used dramatic rhetoric to refer to people throughout the government. Uh, he called Truman and Senator, uh, Secretary of State Dean Atchison, quote, the Pied Pipers of the Politburo. Uh, he, 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 he. Truman uh, retorted back and, uh, and at one point referred to McCarthy as the best asset the Kremlin has because he's, a, he's sowing so many divisions in society. Um, but, as I said, McCarthy and other prominent anti-communist figures uh, in politics, this is having an effect. 1950, 1952, the Republican Party gains significantly in those elections, and in 1952, elected Republican president pushing this communist and government issue that McCarthy had brought to the forefront. And this sort of attack on Truman, liberals in government, intellectuals, on journalists, this becomes a common element of uh, McCarthy's attack. Uh, when the Republicans gained control of the Senate in 1953, McCarthy is given chairmanship of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation. And unlike HUAC, he has the ability to subpoena. He has the ability to get records and documents. He actually goes out of his way to tell people working in government to bring files from your offices to me so that I can investigate people. That's a felony. You can't do that. You know, he openly sort of suggests this. And he begins over the next few years a, a wide-ranging investigation. His common phrase, are you now or have you ever been a member of a communist front organization? I'm trying not to speak. He has a certain speaking tone. You know, have you ever been a member of a communist front organization? 
answer the question. Uh, if he got badgered by a witness, he would sort of claim, point of order, point of order. Basically, shut up. I'm the committee chair. He would interrupt members of the committee. Uh, he did not allow the Democratic members of the committee to have any staff. And most of them walked off just because he, you know, was sort of domineering this committee. And he chose as his main uh, sort of attorney for the committee, Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn does most of the sort of in-depth investigation, liaisoning with the FBI uh, and many others. And McCarthy's investigations, well, how many communists do they find? His investigations look deeply into a number of elements of life, uh, particularly in the State Department. They investigate the Voice of America program, thinking it's full of communist influence. Uh, probably one of the more sillier ones is they actually investigate the overseas library program of the State Department and actually go and check what all the books are in the libraries across the State Department branches in Europe. Roy Cohn is joined with an investigator named David Shine. If you know any know anything about the two of them. There are allegations that start to develop around the time in private that Cohn and Shine are more than just colleagues, romantically involved uh, in some way. Um, they, they basically don't find anything really dramatic there, but through these hearings, they bring up a number of you know, people, uh, most famously Reed Harris, who had written a book in the early 30s, critical of the university system. Um, and they do a number of hearings. In 1953 alone, McCarthy has 143 days of hearings. And if you know Congress, that's a lot of hearings. Over 600 people are called before McCarthy's committee. And even just being called, being subpoenaed, people lost their jobs. People were not reappointed to positions. It was basically seen that if that happened, you must be guilty. Now, McCarthy eventually goes too far, and this is kind of involves some of the work that Cohn and Shine were doing as well. McCarthy gets focused that there is this installation in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, this is where a lot of the atomic information was coming out of. And he believes that this is where the sort of spies are selling our secrets. Uh, they asked the army to produce the documents out of their loyalty investigations and uh, President Eisenhower actually signed an executive order saying any of these army investigations documents were executive branch privilege. They were not to be given to the legislative branch. McCarthy's committee calls uh, a hero of World War II, Brigadier General Ralph Swicker, who's the commander, and asks him to produce this evidence. He refuses. Uh, eventually, the main uh, sort of allegation is involving this dentist who was on the base, uh, who may or may have been a communist, and he gets promoted through the normal promotion procedure in the army. Um, this becomes a sort of a, a, a intense focus. Uh, and then around the same time that they begin investigating the army, CBS's uh, program, See It Now, led by journalist Edward R. Murr, begins a series of broadcasts uh, looking at McCarthy and his tactics. It is the first time Americans on television, when there are only three networks, can see McCarthy interact with people, badgering witnesses. Also, at times, often appearing drunk. He drank heavily, and it's obvious at times, even in black and white, he's bloodshot. He kind of, he's not slurring his speech, but it kind of maybe explains some of his erratic behavior at times. And this begins to turn public opinion uh, very, very dramatically. Eventually, his undoing happens because he's starting to tick off the army. The president is the army hero. Many of the people McCarthy's attacking are friends of. Eisenhower. Uh, we now know that basically Eisenhower tells the army to take the gloves off. Uh, moderate Republican senators also begin sort of distancing themselves from McCarthy as well. And a series of hearings, the Army McCarthy hearings, are held to investigate the charges uh, that he's leveling. Uh, this is a very dramatic, it's, it's one of the first major televised political events that Americans could watch during the day. It's like a soap opera. The Army chose this great attorney, uh, Mr. Welsh, who's seen here kind of just like, oh, stop. Just stop. Talking. Welsh is the perfect opponent. He is dry. He is funny. He can put down McCarthy very quickly with this sort of rhetorical wit he has. 
Um, and, at one, and at the dramatic moment, uh, it comes at a moment when Cohn and Welch had actually agreed that Welch would not talk about Cohn and Shine, some of what going on, maybe, and that in exchange, McCarthy and Cohn would not talk about this attorney at Welch's firm who had had some associations with communist front organizations. McCarthy decides, I, hey, I'm under attack, I'm going there. And he brings up this attorney, Fred Fisher. You can see on the television, they cut the cone, and his face is just like, he takes deep breath. You can just tell he's about ready to explode. And Welch just unloads on him in a very nice, diplomatic, direct way. And famously asks the senator, do you not have any decency, sir? At long last, have you no shred of decency anymore? And he, McCarthy just has nothing really to, to say to this. He's eventually censored by the U.S. Senate and actually dies less than three years later. Uh, you know, he was a heavy drinker. But had a major, major influence uh, over American political life, for sure. As I said, while we focus on McCarthy, there are a variety of other ways that this is influencing other aspects of American life. So I want to uh, sort of focus in the rest of my time on some of these other aspects. One of the more dramatic effects it has is in the labor movement. In the 30s and 40s, the labor movement had been very successful, and by 1945, there are 15 million union members. This is the height of labor's power in the United States. And an important wheeling figure in Walter Ruther and the United Automobile Workers had launched a successful strike at the start of this Cold War period at home against General Motors. Uh, Ruther had famously led a strike that was not just calling for better wages and working conditions, but saying the union had a right to make business decisions. Asking GM, open your books so that we can see what you're spending money on. And the labor movement was involved in supporting the efforts of the, uh, the New Deal Fair Deal, particularly national health insurance, among many others. And this, and the strike wave in 1946 makes them a target of uh, opposition. When the Republicans take back control of Congress, they pass one of the most important pieces of legislation in U.S. labor history, the Taft-Hartley Act. This is a dramatic piece of legislation that makes it much, much more difficult for unions to operate. It outlawed sympathy strikes, so that multiple unions going out on strike to support a campaign. Uh, it, it really kind of limits the ability of unions to operate uh, in certain areas. The two most important aspects are the requirement that union leaders had to sign anti-communist affidavits, and they had to eliminate any organizers who were known communists. And to be fair, there were a number of known communists operating in a number of unions, unions like the United Mine Workers, for example, the Steel Workers Union, among many others. The most important section in the long run involved for Section 14B that allowed states to prohibit the union shop and pass what were known as right to work laws. Pretty quickly after the law went into effect, mostly southern and western states passed laws making it much more difficult for unions to uh, effectively organize. And of course, we, we still have right to work laws that states can pass and are still passing. The labor movement responds in kind to this, realizing, you know what, this is going to be the society we're operating in. If we want to stay and keep our bargaining position, we're going to have to deal with this issue of communists in the labor movement. At the time, the CIO is led by Phil Murray from the Steelworkers Union, who is a devout Roman Catholic. And is pretty distrustful of some of the communists and communist-led unions. And in 1949-1950, the CIO will oust and expel 11 unions that they call that are left-led lean. Uh, many of them organized uh, a variety of types of workers. Uh, you know, they tended to be very, uh, you know, sort of immigrant-dominated, uh, heavy African-American populations, but they were all across, all across the country. Uh, this immediately lost the CIO about a million members, so weakening their bargaining position, but the idea being that we can't be supporting unions that uh, have these sort of uh, these sort of individuals. There he is. Ruther himself, while he had been supportive of communist organizers before, uh, adapts to this new situation as well. And we see this in his next big strike campaign with the UAW 
1950, which leads to what many refer to as the Treaty of Detroit. Out of this agreement, the union gets higher wages and better benefits. The UAW members will have a higher, a good pension, good health care system, and cost of living adjustments. In exchange, the union will not ask to have any role in business and management decisions. This also will create a sort of more arbitrated system of labor relations in the UAW and other unions as well. We see a decline in militancy. We don't see the big dramatic strikes that we see in the first half of the 20th century. From 1950 until the end of the century, you don't see as many of these dramatic strikes. Unions, while they might seem adversarial, in many respects are tied to the success of business firms. If GM does well, workers make better wages, they get a better retirement, better health care. Uh, so why would there be as much of a, a reason to strike, so to speak? Another thing that the unions have to give up on is uh, the sort of support for a public welfare system, particularly national health insurance. Um, so uh, this, they sort of agree to allow for privatized health insurance plans among, among other types of issues. And historians ever since have, at various times criticized this period, the sort of lack of militancy, the sort of lack of sort of say that local rank and file union members would have. Uh, I think that's changed a bit because this was the high point of America best benefits that most union members ever had. And in a time when unions are on the decline, historians are looking at this period a little differently. Maybe it was, maybe it was a smart move these leaders made uh, at this time in hindsight. Uh, so if labor is one area of, of changes, another is in the area of education. Um, now, of course, one of the biggest concerns was that if there was going to be communist influence, it was going to be teachers influencing children. What are they doing in the classroom? We don't know. By 1952, 30 states in the country required all teachers to sign a loyalty oath to keep their jobs. Most major universities also required loyalty oaths. My university, WBU, in the early 50s had a loyalty oath that you had to, you had to sign. And that's not unusual. Every, basically every university adopts this. Local school boards, universities, uh, public, public concerned people in the public began paying attention to what teachers were teaching, what kind of books were they using. In some cases, officers were hired to sit in in college classrooms to watch liberal-leaning professors. Uh, students were encouraged to report on their professors uh, and teachers. If they discussed anything critical of the United States, I would have been. Um, one state fought, and this is kind of silly in hindsight, I just, I just want to mention this. One state fought and got mentioned, got a mention to Robin Hood removed because he stole from the rich and gave, gave to the poor. Another, the coverage of the Native American, what happened to Native Americans was sort of removed and any discussion of African American slavery to the program. Um, a good example of sort of how this played out at two different universities is my home institution of WVU versus Fairmont State. WBU, there were no firings uh, because of President Irvin Stewart, uh, Stewart Hall, it's named after. President Stewart defended the rights of faculty, but was also, you know, strong in saying that, you know, we're going to make sure that there's no sort of communist influence going on at WBU. Uh, in some of his papers uh, that, I, that I and others, other of my colleagues have looked at, there were some incidences that came up. One that kind of uh, tickles me was one of my colleagues years ago in the history department, Professor Thomas Ennis had given a speech at uh, Jane Lou in West, uh, Central West Virginia, where he'd given the Japanese perspective on Pearl Harbor and why they did what they did. Bad move, bad move. And people writing and complaining. One of the, my most favorite that I show to students in my classes is this woman who wrote in to U.S. Senator Harley Kilgore from West Virginia, disturbed by an article that, her, that she had read that was published in the Daily Anthenaeum newspaper, the DA, the student newspaper. And this author uh, was talking about Marxism in a positive sort of way, and she was just flabbergasted. Now, if you had read the entire article, as Senator Kilgore and President Stewart then talked about it in the letters, the student was talking about the Marxism of Groucho Marx. 
And wouldn't this make a greater country if we followed the Marxism of Groucho Marx? Actually, I can't remember the individual's name. He actually went on to become a very prominent sports uh, journalist for many years. Uh, and Senator Kilgore was just like, this is silly. And this was happening at the height of the you know, sort of army party. So, uh, these, these issues were out there. In comparison at Fairmont State, uh, there was a case involving a professor, an art historian, and department chair named Luella Mundell. She had been recently hired. She was an outsider. She was pretty fairly liberal. She uh, was called a bohemian because she wore pants. And she was an agnostic, which in rural, small town West Virginia. She supported and taught about modern art. She was not a member of the Communist Party, but because of some of the things she was teaching about, talking about, she basically gets run out of here. And this became a bigger political issue. It involved uh, the other U.S. Senator at the time, uh, Matthew Neely, um, who was from Fairmont as well, and it got, it got very contentious. But to show you that different things happened at different, different institutions. But to me, the most interesting is the effect this has on popular culture. And I don't mean this in any negative way, but knowing our audience here and at home, some of you may have grew up during this time, I'm guessing. My, my, I, I told my dad about this before I came, and he said, yeah, I remember a lot of these shows. And one of the things historians have noticed is the influence this had on television and film. And you see this in the, the types of thing, uh, things that are on television at the time. The most prominent shows that emerged at this time are game shows, westerns, and for my dad's benefit, Gunsmoke, which he's probably watching right now. If I had to guess, he's probably watching this. Uh, you know, Gunsmoke and uh, the you know these sort of uh, sitcom shows like Leave It to Beaver, Father Knows Best, I Love Lucy. If you look back on them, they're great shows. Is there any like hard hitting themes really ever discussed? Not really, and this is partly because of the aftermath of the HUAC hearings and some of the concerns at the time. If you study these shows and films, you see that because of the uh, concerns about communists and government and society, there was a crackdown on what was being produced in these uh, cultural images. There was a certain type of conformity, and there's reasons for this. I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. During the 1947 HUAC hearings, when they investigated the Hollywood and film industry, HUAC published a report called Red Channel red channels on the television. And this is like a TV guide to tell you, hey, if you watch television or film, we just want you to know that these actors and these directors and these screenwriters have questionable associations. Uh, it published a number of names, people who had criticized Shuak or others that had been named in a number of ways. People like Lee J. Cobb, as I mentioned, Orson Welles, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Cliff Robertson, another prominent actor. Uh, and anybody who was listed in red channels was effectively blacklisted. Maybe not as entirely like you could never get hired, but there were a number of individuals where that's what happened. You see this kind of conformity as well in Hollywood films as well, where they have dramatic popular anti-communist influences. Uh, so Gentlemen's Agreement, I was a communist for the FBI, uh, my three most prominent ones that I'll mention that I like myself. First is a film called My Son John, which there's still of it from the dramatic scene in that film in the top right. In this film, in this dramatic moment, the mother makes her son take an oath on the Bible that he will never and has never been a member of the Communist Party. Mainstream, this sort of image and idea. Another is a, one of the most popularly acclaimed films of the time period on the waterfront. Has anybody seen on the waterfront? Marlon Brando won the, won, the, you know, won the Academy Award for. This is an Elliot Kazan film, one of the prominent directors who had testified before HUAC and actually named names. He was very much criticized in Hollywood at the time. And if you've watched the film, or maybe now go back and watch it, the film is about this member of this longshoreman's union, Marlon Brando, who's a would-be boxer, who is going to give evidence about an investigation of what's going on in the corruption in his local union. 
And it's all about whether it's okay for him to snitch or not. It's a, in a way, it's a dramatic representation of what Kazan himself had done. Uh, and of course, you know, what people remember is who Marlon Brando's speech for is that I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody, but really what the film is about is sort of saying it's okay to inform on people doing bad things. Now in the movie, it's corruption in a union, but it's kind of a theme for the broader. The other example is High Noon, starring Gary Cooper, which is a great film. It's one of my dad's favorite films. It has under, these sort of anti-communist undertones as well. And if you know the film, Gary Cooper is this lawman who there's this sort of figure coming back to the town. And everyone's telling him to leave. His new wife is telling him to leave. And he's going around town trying to get people to help. Nobody wants to help. No one wants to stand up because there's going to be three gunfighters coming into town. And Cooper dramatically stands up to them. He stops, he kills them, he stops them. And what does he do at the end of the film? He takes his badge and quits. Now, at the time, this was seen as a very sort of dramatic uh, thing. And people interpreted the film in different ways. Was Cooper sort of saying that society had to stand up against evil and people were being sort of weak? Was it this sort of criticism of the time period? You know, people kind of interpreted it in different ways. But on television, shows like Fathers Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver obviously are showing a certain image of uh, what good family values would have been at the time. Uh, this is actually a, 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 a sort of listing from Red Channels. In particular, I call attention to the section dealing with Madeline Lee. Madeline Lee was an actress on radio primarily. And she's listed in red channels, although later it's learned that there were several Madeline Lees. They had different spellings of their names. And whether it was the Madeline Lee that got blacklisted, who was actually the person that you know, maybe was involved in some of these different groups. Also, notice what the groups are. The National Council of Art and Sciences and Professions, the Joint Anti-Fascist Refugee Committee, uh, the National Negro Congress, And of course, at the time you have dominating television, you know, reality shows, the rise of soap operas during the day. Uh, and of course, uh, game shows, and particularly concerns about rigged game shows like the uh, game show 21, uh, where there was a scandal involving the fact that uh, there was a, a contestant who was basically being given the answers uh, because the ratings were pretty high every time, whenever he first appeared on, on the show. Uh, he was on there for a significant period of time later it was revealed the whole thing was basically rigged. The prominence of westerns where it was clear uh, good and evil uh, on sort of other types of shows where there were clear good guys and bad guys. I'm, for some reason I'm thinking of Perry Mason. You know, every time Perry Mason was in the trial it was, it was very clear cut. Westerns such as Gunsmoke, you know, clear good and evil. Sure, you know, Matt Dillon always gets the bad guy. Same over and over. I don't know why Dad keeps watching because he's seen all of them at this point. They all have the same thing, basically. But this sort of forced conformity is an element of what we were seeing in the sort of cultural realm of the Cold War. And even at the time, cutting edge journalism shows like See It Now on CBS, it eventually gets forced out after McCarthy's downfall. Uh, McMurrow was looking into other sort of things at the time, you know, at the start of the Civil Rights Movement and other concerns. Uh, this was not going to and lastly, I would say that the sort of last element of what some historians call uh, the sort of domestic side of containment is happening on the American home front. People will refer to this as suburban containment, that at the time, the government is going to try to support through grant programs, Federal Housing Authority, the GI Bill, uh, highway construction, this sort of suburbanization of the country. Uh, at the time, uh, officials speak of how this is helping to produce a strong and upstanding nuclear family during the nuclear age, so to speak. At the same time as well, there will be concerns about any sort of uh, elements of sort of family life or private relationships uh, that can be seen as subversive. So concerns of what, were known as the, what was known as the lavender scare, concern about homosexuals. LGBT community as well. And of course, this is dramatic, this sort of uh, suburban sort of uh, way as being sort of the way that America needs to be organized is put on a dramatic scene when 
Uh, Khrushchev and Vice President Richard Nixon debate uh, at a conference, uh, which was later referred to as the kitchen debate. But the sort of support for uh, suburban housing, uh, highway development, research in uh, you know, sort of R&D and other things, it all helped to sort of support that sort of standard of living that we all look back on in a very sort of positive way. It is an element of this Cold War uh, as well. Uh, and it is being encouraged. It's not just something that naturally is happening. It's happening for uh, very obvious uh, policy decisions as well. Um, so I hope you get an appreciation of the various ways the Cold War is sort of influencing here on the home front changes to American politics, the style of American politics, the influence on our sort of labor relations, uh, in our popular culture, and in the way that we sort of organize uh, our family structures and I'll, uh, they told me about an hour, and so I want to give you some time for questions. Uh, but thank you for your time and attention. Question? Yes. Was Roosevelt's VP Henry Wallace a communist? There were strong allegations that he that he was, or was at least uh, the phrase that's commonly used at the time is if they can't prove that somebody's a communist, they'll just say he's a he or she's a fellow traveler. Right. Meaning they travel in close circles, but maybe they're not like a formal member of the party. Walt, Wallace, who runs a sort of a, a third party presidential campaign in 1948. Uh, you know, he really gets attacked for some of his associations when he was in the agriculture department, uh, when he was uh, obviously VP as well. His views on the Cold War, I mean, he's probably one of the more vocal critics of containment, the doctrine I think you've probably heard about already in previous lectures. But yeah, fellow travelers probably what I would use. There, there's this sort of designation you see of the people that we see that are clearly communists, the people that are you know, fellow travelers where they're doing things that are very questionable. There is sort of, there was another designation that was sort of referred to as fifth column communists. Like they're doing things where they're questioning and debating things at the time, but they're probably not a communist. And then there's just all the people who are just being associated because of the sort of wide web that's being sort of cast. I just have a question on, on the suburban containment. containment. But don't you think part of it was was racist because all the white folks moved to the suburbs and mm -hmm. and all the black not yeah. just not just this anti communist thing but racism in, in, in the United States. I mean, part and, and people who've studied this, one of the things they look at is in the Federal Housing Authority and the way these loans were given out. They also build off of practices we see in the 30s with sort of the designations given to certain neighborhoods in terms of getting loans. So the, the redlining, the sort of A, A to D sort of rankings for neighborhoods, which, by the way, they actually, I think it's, I'm not sure which library it is, but it's online. They've actually digitized the map for Wheeling. It's very interesting. And if you look at the maps of Wheeling, the, the suburban communities are all the A and Bs. Downtown, most of downtown Wheeling is Cedar Day. South Wheeling, I think it's D. East Wheeling, D. And on the backs, they give very, you know, in the case of Wheeling and other communities, they give descriptions. They'll say, uh, this has a higher minority population. This has a lot of factories and industries, so naturally, you don't want to loan them out for home run. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, historians have critically looked at this, have said, you know, that's part of it as well, but also at the time, what's being promoted is sort of the standard American nuclear family. It's often white family living in the suburbs not African-American families living, you know, in public housing or living in a bigger city like Chicago, New York, or elsewhere. You know, that is definitely. And at the time, you know, for the civil rights movement, this is, this is one of the reasons that movement had gained traction in the 30s and 40s, and people defined that it starts again in the mid-50s. Well, where did it go? Well, it, it was still going on, but it was the fact that people in civil rights campaigns often were being labeled as communists as well because you're questioning the status quo. In the Deep South, in terms of state politics there, Southern politicians, they pick up on the sort of anti-communist issue as a way to criticize calls for civil rights. Anybody calling for civil rights, you're questioning the status quo. That's what the communists want. Well, in reality, it's part of a longer you know, campaign to you know, upturn Jim Crow and the segregated system in the South. That's partly chronological why historians you know, say, why does it take the, late, the mid 50s through the 60s to see those changes? It's because of the height of 
context is important as well. That's a, that's a good question. Other questions? I don't know if we have questions from the online audience potentially as well. Yeah, sure. Why did it take so long for the Venona intercepts to come out? Because it seems to me that the anti anti communism that McCarthy is a produce has had a corrosive effect on society for just years and years. Yeah. Part of it is because, you know, we have some of the things that were documents that were held here. Uh, the Veneta documents really they come out after the fall of the Soviet Union. So when other any East European governments, for example, so like when the East German police uh, is disbanded uh, in Poland and elsewhere, we have access to their files now. And in these files, you, people that study it can quickly find all. Oh, here's communications with and where they're referencing the Rosenberg. To know. Were they U.S. intercepts? They were, and some of it was partly trying to decode some of the, the coding because okay. they, they didn't know the sort of other side of it. Once they were able to figure all that out, it, and it really led to a lot of debate. Like, historians debating each other sounds like a very benign subject, but this is one that's been very heated for many years. Was people, you know, that would say everything about this anti-communist crusade was wrong. They just missed the mark, and then there were historians who said no. There were communists in government. So in the 90s, it's really, okay. So it led to a more of a consensus to say, yeah, there were people doing bad things. And we need to acknowledge that, and that's wrong. But then also to say, critically, I think to your point, it created a corrosive atmosphere and a set of tactics that many people across the spectrum were, were very concerned about. McCarthy, you know, and, the, and the fact that McCarthy took it to this sort of nth degree and kind of normalized it really, that really concerned people. But in a way, it's kind of good because it finally explained, yeah, the Rosenbergs, yeah, they were guilty. Alger Hiss, he was guilty. You know, these other folks were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. But all the thousands of other Americans who had to quit their jobs or lost their jobs because their name was thrown out in the HUAC hearing or in the McCarthy hearings, well, we don't see them because they obviously were communists. Or people who were in like civil rights organizations or labor organizations or other groups that just, you know, they were questioning things at the time that were fair things to question. Uh, but it was not the time to really raise those types of issues. Yes? So, how many of them were truly communists? More It's very difficult. Uh, I'd have to really sort of look at that a little more just to sort of check off each of them. Uh, it's fair to assume a number of them. The associations are pretty clear. Um, look at the types of scripts and stories they were writing before they were investigated. They have very either anti-American sentiments, anti-capitalist sentiments. Um, but other films, you know, they were, you know, they were just raised and sort of critical things at the time. But I, I'd have to check off myself. I don't May or may not have been communist. One of the problems that they had was actually proving this. I mean, it was actually, there's, that's why there's so few people they actually can point to and say, yeah, this person was a communist that was in government or something else. Uh, now, there were people who, when they came before HUAC, they would ask them, they would sort of get used to the fact, well, they'll just say, I plead the fifth. But then there were people who say, yeah, I've been a communist for 12 years. Oh, okay. I can be a communist in this country. You can make fun of me. You have the freedom to do that. I have the freedom to do this. Now, the problem would come up, then they'd say, okay, but now tell me the names of your fellow, fellow No, I'm not going to do that. And that's where they would get these people in trouble. But there were people that were brought up who would just flat out say, sure, I'm not going to commit perjury. I'm a communist. You know, Earl Browder was brought before the committee. It's like, I'm, I'm the head of the Communist Party in America. Do you think I need to, like, defend myself? <laughs> Um, you know, there's other people like, of course, you know, and that was kind of Ronald Reagan's comment was, we know who you are. You know, we, they have trouble getting jobs. Like, we don't need to sort of go after other people who, you know, have these sort of loose. And I think there were certain people who also had this sort of more of a, we would call it a libertarian sort of critique to say, you know, let them say what they want. And in our society, we'll just put, put them down. We'll just say, that's not what America's about. We'll just make fun of them. Will not, you know, their ideas will lose out. Uh, but at the time, there's this concern that these ideas are getting sort of infiltrated within things that maybe people aren't so aware of, and it can be influencing people subconsciously. So, uh, but that's a good question. I'm actually going to look this up so I can know for the future. But I am intrigued to see how many.
Many of them later, it was revealed that they had been writing scripts. Uh, some of them actually won Academy Awards under Susan. Trumbo won, you know, he won under a pseudonym. Uh, one of the other ones, I think, won under. The Bridge on the River Kwai was one where it won the Academy Award. It's like, who's the person that wrote this? Oh, right. Yeah. And then some people, if they were blacklisted initially, if they gave a public denouncement, they were sort of allowed to come back and sort of you know, engage in all of them in, in a variety of ways. Uh, but some of them just said, I'm not going to do that because I didn't do anything just because I was a member of an organization. that, And the other thing is people would say, you know, I was a member of the Communist Party, but I got disillusioned with it and thought it was stupid. So why am I now going to be punished that I was a communist in 1932 when at the height of the Depression there were a lot of people questioning things? In a way, they would sort of argue to these committees, it isn't what I did what you would want an American to do? I, I looked into it. I was a member. I did not like that we had to follow this Stalinist party line, and I got the heck out of there. And they sort of didn't understand, well, now why am I being punished for you know, way doing the patriotic thing? It's because they wouldn't get names. That was often what they were going to be criticized. The other thing is if you consider the New Deal by Franklin Roosevelt, it was they were far left ideas. Sure. In sure. Absolutely. There was no social security. There was Absolutely. no banking regulations. Absolutely. There was no FDIC. Mm -hmm. All of these things that Roosevelt brought up were far left ideas. Yep. Yep. And, and, and so even mainstream politics mm -hmm. were, was leading sure. towards sure. the left. Yeah, and in the 30s, Hugh Act, the things that they investigated. Tended to, be the, tended to be the programs that were the most to the left, like the Federal Theater Project. Some of the agricultural programs, I mean, there was a program called the Resettlement Administration, which just sounds very, very radical. Uh, but there were things that were criticized at the time that, you were, that they didn't really get as much focus on, like the CCC, because people were like, oh, this is, this is a great program. Like, this is doing great work. You're the WPA. So great work. It was those types of things where it was involved in culture. So what's, what are the types of theater productions? The American Guide series, uh, in particular, the West Virginia American Guide book, uh, was one of the last ones to be published because there were allegations that the people involved on it were communists in the late 30s. And early 30s. Um, so again, too, this is a longer period than just that sort of immediate post-war period. It's got a longer, a much, much longer deeper history, too. Other questions? I appreciate you all coming out. Thank you all. So close to Christmas. And now we can watch It's a Wonderful Life and wonder, man, what did they have a problem with with this stuff?